traffic, traffic. There's PPL, CPL, MEL, ATP, and instrument rating as well. A CFI, double I, M E I, H I with an oral exam from hell. We get ADIS and AWAS and ASOS for weather subscriptions to AOPA. EAA, ADIS, Oshkos, FA, REM, Texas, and BISH, that's NBAA. There are meters and tasks for weather forecasts. No temps with local ND. There's air mitts and segments and high was broadcast advised by ATC. Hello, and thank you for joining us for episode 95 of the Aviation News Talk podcast, where we bring you general aviation news and safety tips that pilots and student pilots like you can use. You just heard part of the acronym song sung by comedian Captain Victor Roger, who will tell you more about him and his comedy during our update section. And later, we'll be talking in detail about how to make great crosswind landings. Plus, this week in the news, the U.S. government continues to be shut down, and we'll talk about how the shutdown is affecting aviation. And there's a candidate for mayor in Chicago who's proposing to reopen the old MiGs airport. And finally, we have the story of an ex-Navy SEAL who's a pilot and how he helped capture a drug runner. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about general aviation. I'm Max Trescott. I'm here to educate and inform you and have some fun along the way if you're new to the show. I'm the 2008 National CFI, and these days I specialize in Cirrus aircraft like the SR-20, SR-22, and SF-50 Vision Jet. So if you're starting to think about maybe someday you'll buy one of those or you might like some training in one, please call me today for a free consultation and possibly a free demo flight. Now, last week in episode 94, we talked with Master CFI Gary Reeves about his tips for using ForeFlight. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out. Next week, we have an interview with a product manager for the new Cirrus Vision Jet G2 that was announced two weeks ago. And we did that interview while sitting in the very first G2 to be delivered. All this and more, and the news starts now. From the Chicago Sun-Times, a mayoral candidate, Willie L. Wilson, has written responses to questions about his candidacy. In it, he said that he would like to reopen Miggs Field. Miggs, he says, was the second largest business district airport in North America. It was closed when Chicago Mayor Richard Daley ordered the runway destroyed by bulldozers. He says during the early 1970s, there were up to eight round-trip nonstop flights a day between MiGs and the Illinois State Capitol in Springfield, and he also mentions a number of commuter airways that provided service from that airport. He says, today the space is mostly unused as a concert venue and a hard-to-reach park yielding only $55,000 to city operations. When it was opened as an airport, it contributed between $300 million and $500 million income per year. Now, when there's a race to produce a new type of flying transportation called VTOLs that operate like a large drone or small helicopter, he says that we could possibly use a facility just like that to help the city's growing needs. He says, we have seen the proliferation of tourist helicopter services in the past few years and that they need to be based far away from the lakefront tourist district. He says, clearly the lakefront airport would increase this usage by both tourist and business people. He says, I propose the restoration of this important third airport with planned enhancements for 21st century personal air travel and much needed revenue source. And all I can add to that is if you live in Chicago, please help get Willie L. Wilson elected as the mayor of Chicago. It would be great to see that airport come back. Of course, our big story is that we are in day 35 of the government shutdown, and it's having a major effect across the economy, but especially in aviation. This morning from WMTW.com, that's Channel 8 out of Portland, Maine, they say that major airports are experiencing widespread delays amid staffing issues. The FAA halted all flights entering LaGuardia Airport in New York for about an hour Friday due to staffing issues with the airport's air traffic controllers. All departing flights were subject to an average ground delay of 40 minutes due to the staffing shortage, according to the FAA's website. The FAA also says air traffic was delayed at Philadelphia and Newark International in New Jersey due to staffing issues. Quote, we have experienced a slight increase in sick leave at two air traffic control facilities affecting New York and Florida, the FAA said in a statement. As with severe storms, we will adjust operations to a safe rate to match available controller resources. And from generalaviationnews.com, more than 30 aviation industry groups and unions are urging the federal government to end the partial government shutdown, citing its harmful effects on the industry. As the partial shutdown continues, the human and economic consequences are increasing and doing great harm, the groups wrote in a joint letter to the president and the Senate and House majority leaders. 
Civil aviation supports more than 7% of the U.S. gross domestic product and $1.5 trillion of economic impact, affecting over 11.5 million jobs. But the shutdown is hampering our ability to function effectively. The letter cited several areas of concern to the industry. I'm not going to mention all of them, but they did mention hardships faced by the FAA and air traffic controllers, uh, TSA and Custom and Border Protection personnel who are also working without pay uh, and having fewer transportation security officers available to screen travelers at checkpoints. Uh, Wait times will grow, which has, in fact, been the case we've seen in other news reports at Atlanta Airport and other airports around the country. And they list numerous other impacts. And from avweb.com, NATCA, the National Air Traffic Controller Association, has filed a lawsuit against the U.S. government alleging that members have been unlawfully deprived of their earned wages without due process. In a follow-up to that story from politico.com, a federal judge declined to stop the Trump administration from requiring government employees to work without pay during the shutdown, rejecting the arguments of two federal unions, uh, which, of course, included uh, NATCA. So that uh, particular lawsuit is now stopped. Also from avweb.com, a GoFundMe campaign aimed at supplying groceries and gas money for local air traffic controllers not receiving pay has been suspended by its founder due to the potential for ethics violations. Hearing that some controllers were struggling after missed paychecks, GA pilot Graham Smith started the GoFundMe campaign. He approached several aviation organizations for legal advice. The responses he received were mixed. One organization's legal team believed that if distributed properly, the money might fall under an exception that allows federal employees to accept gifts of $20 or less per year. Uh, another organization advised that there was no clear way to avoid ethical violations if controllers accepted any of the funds. And from CNN.com, the government shutdown has stalled accident investigations, according to the NTSB. They say that 87 accidents have not been investigated since the government shutdown more than 30 days ago started. They list uh, incidents including aircraft, automobile, and other accidents. What this means in real terms is we are missing prevention opportunities, said Dolene Hatchett, an NTSB spokeswoman. Important evidence is being lost that we would normally examine following an accident. And this evidence could potentially support safety recommendations that, once adopted, could prevent future accidents and save countless lives. The NTSB has 397 employees total. 365 of those people are furloughed. Six staffers were recalled to assist in international aviation accidents. And from Brinkwire.com, I'm sure you've heard this story. Canadian air traffic controllers have bought hundreds of pizzas for their American counterparts in uh, support of U.S. controllers during the uh, government shutdown. And then separately, I was listening to the Opposing Bases podcast earlier this week, and the two air traffic controllers who host that show mentioned that they had been fed every day this week at the airport by local airport businesses, including a flight school that had fed them several times this week. Now, I mentioned in episode 93, a prediction that some of the 18% of air traffic controllers who are eligible to retire will decide to retire now because of not being paid during the shutdown. Sadly, I learned last week that a controller who was a supervisor in a local tower and a 10-year veteran of the FAA decided to quit his job. Well, I'm guessing there might have been other things that led him to quit. Clearly, the shutdown was the final straw that caused him to resign. I taught this gentleman to fly 15 years ago while he was in college. And Michael, I wish you well in all of your future endeavors. Here's a post from reddit.com by a controller. He says, these views are my own, don't represent the FAA or NATCA. I'm writing to give some insight to the pilot community as to what it's been like at my facility the past few weeks. I'm at a level 12 Tracon, which I think is a pretty high, large, uh, you know, level Tracon. So we'd have to assume that's associated with a Class B airport. And he says, before the partial shutdown took place, we were already at minimum staffing. Morale has gone down sharply in the past week. He says the reality set in that there will be no direct deposit and likely two more weeks uh, that will be the same as well. He says there are dueling attitudes among controllers, some screaming matches in the break room, and more bickering than normal during the day. Uh, More irritability on the part of controllers who are usually very even-tempered. At smaller facilities, young controllers with less than three years of experience are figuring out how to make it work. Some have signed up to drive Uber during their days off. He says if you're established, so I guess someone who's been around longer, you take a look at savings and figure out how many months you can handle it. The positive that I want to reinforce to everyone is that when it comes to actual working clearances, traffic advisory, separation, and the basic core of our job safety, I have not seen one person who has done anything unprofessional or unsafe at heart. Controllers still take pride in doing their job, even if the pay is in question. 
What will happen shortly, I think, are dramatic reductions in daily staffing at facilities that will lead to delays. And of course, we just saw the first of those today. We can't run as many planes in space if we don't have people to do it. If it continues to February and this is going on, there will be rate reductions at what are called the core 30 airports or the busiest airports and airlines will cancel accordingly. Uh, many controllers think that public pressure plus airlines losing money will be something that motivates the president to budge. He says there's a decent relationship between the union and management and other things strained as of late. Uh, they're expecting that we pack finals, that is the final approach, regardless of staffing after two hours on position. Fatigue is an issue and it only worsens as the week goes on. Uh, NATCA has strongly encouraged each and every controller to remain professional and dedicated and to not do anything that would compromise the national airspace system. That position has not set well with everyone. It's been fortunate that through the last uh, 20 days, we haven't had thunderstorms. He tells a short story about a uh, GA pilot who uh, ended the conversation with maybe next time we'll get better service out of you. Apparently, he didn't get the clearance he was looking for. This controller continues. Just remember the guy on the radio is at work every day. Not sure how the mortgage will get paid later this year. And from AOPA.org, they say that holders of temporary airman certificates that are about to expire during the partial shutdown may request authority on the FAA website to continue exercising their airman privileges. The temporary authority is valid for 60 days. They include step-by-step -step instructions to check your status and request temporary authority. Uh, now, the article is too long to read, but if you have a temporary certificate that's about to expire, go to our show notes at aviationnewstalk.com, and you'll find a link to that AOPA article. And looking at other news, this comes from generalaviationnews.com. A new report shows that the number of fatal training accidents dropped 35% from 2000 through 2015. The report put together by AOPA's Air Safety Institute, along with Liberty University School of Aeronautics, is an analysis of 240 fatal instructional accidents, so those with a CFI on board, uh, in piston engine aircraft over the 16-year period. It concludes the greatest risk in flight training are loss of control, which was 54% of the accidents, and mid-air collisions, which was 10%. The report categorized fatal flight training accidents and calculated the accident rate using the FAA's survey data. Quote, the study sheds light on fatal flight training accident causes, but it also confirms a reduction of accidents over a 16-year period, said AOPA ASI Executive Director Richard McSpadden. Quote, the best way we can continue that positive trend and decrease these types of accidents and all accidents is through training, implementation of new technology, and continuing education. And we'll have a link in our show notes to the full report, which can be found on AOPA's website. And also from General Aviation News and about AOPA, they're about to award $1 million in scholarships. AOPA will award 100 scholarships of $10,000 each to 80 aviation safety-minded high school students age 15 to 18 and up to 20 teachers dedicated to advancing aviation education in their classrooms. The application deadline for these You Can Fly High flight training scholarships is April 2nd, 2019 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. The scholarships are made possible by a $1 million grant from the Ray Foundation to the AOPA Foundation. Scholarship recipients can Use the funds to pay direct flight training expenses toward a primary flight certificate. To be eligible, students and teachers must be AOPA members, and student scholarship recipients must complete a flight training milestone, such as achieving either their first solo or earning their private certificate within one year of receiving a scholarship. Winners will be announced at the end of May. And they say the $1 million in scholarships funding from the Ray Foundation is a tenfold increase over the $100,000 in high school scholarships awarded in 2018, according to AOPA officials. And I should add that I was interviewed for the AOPA president job about 10 years ago. And at that time, there were only about $10,000 a year given in AOPA scholarships. So this is a, you know, a fantastic increase. They say in addition to scholarships for high school students and teachers, other AOPA members may apply for awards ranging from $2,500 to $10,000 for primary flight training or advanced certificates and ratings. And in a related story, AOPA Foundation Fundraising Challenge kicks off. The AOPA Foundation has kicked off its 2019 You Can Fly Challenge for the fourth year in a row, giving donors an opportunity for their contributions to be doubled. So for every dollar you might give, the AOPA Foundation is going to get a match from the Ray Foundation, which will match it up to $2 million for a potential total of $4 million. 
And they say the You Can Fly program is getting and keeping more pilots flying with initiative to introduce youth to aviation, improve the flight training experience, support flying clubs, and help lapsed pilots complete their flight review, according to AOPA. The challenge to raise $2 million in donations for a dollar-for-dollar matching grant is an increase over last year's $1.4 million challenge. In 2018, donors rose to the challenge and contributed more than $1.8 million. And from Garmin.com, Garmin International recently unveiled the GTR-200B. That's a communication radio and Bluetooth-equipped intercom for experimental aircraft. So kind of the cool combine the radio with the intercom. They say in addition to advanced auto squelch, stereo intercom, alert inputs, standby frequency monitor, and more, Bluetooth connectivity allows pilots to connect a smartphone or tablet, adding even more capability to the cockpit. Additionally, superior integration with the G3X Touch uh, provides more features and benefits that further reduces pilot workload. That is, if you've got uh, that touchscreen display in your aircraft. And they note that pilots can easily make phone calls and listen to audio entertainment or call flight service or obtain a takeoff clearance using the Bluetooth functionality all through the radio. They say with stereo headsets, uh, incoming audio is spatially separated using their 3D audio processing capability, which, by the way, I've used, and it's pretty handy. It's a lot easier to hear air traffic control if they're largely in one ear as you're listening to the ADIS largely in the other ear. And from iPadPilotNews.com, Flight Plan Go app adds new procedure shortcuts. It's been several months now since Garmin bought the online flight planning company FlightPlan.com. That's F-L-T-Plan.com. And a few of Flight Plan's features have already been incorporated into the Garmin Pilot app. And the story mentions the airport icon layer, a new map layer option allows you to display airport icons on the map with runway depictions that look just like the aircraft icons in Garmin Pilot. And the icons are color-coded too, magenta for non-colored airports and blue for airports with a control tower. And they also mention airport procedures shortcuts. Uh, When viewing the procedures section for an airport, there's an arrow button at the far right of the screen. You just tap that to display shortcut options to add the procedure to the binder or to view it on the map. And they note that Flight Plan Go is available free on the App Store. And from AOPA.org, Boeing flies an electric VTOL prototype. Now, generally, I don't talk about uh, these uh, many VTOL uh, flying aircraft and flying car stories because there are literally a hundred different of them, and uh, most of them have not made it to market. But what's significant about this is it's from Boeing, and it says it didn't fly far, but a takeoff, hover, and landing on January 22nd in Manassas, Virginia, showed the world what revolution looks like, in the words of Aurora Flight Sciences CEO, John Langford. Langford's company, a Boeing subsidiary since 2017, led Boeing's effort to design and build a passenger air vehicle, or PAV, under the Boeing Next program, which aims to bring urban air mobility to the masses in the form of on-demand autonomous air transportation. Now, I met uh, John Langford way back when we were both in college. He later went on to found Aurora Flight Sciences in 1989, and the firm has been designing and adapting aircraft, including GA aircraft, to fly without pilots for many years. I remember, in fact, when they automated a Diamond DA-42 for automatic uh, takeoff and landing without a pilot on board. And the story says, unlike Textron subsidiary Bell and others that are building aircraft to enter the urban air taxi service, with pilots at least at first, the Boeing concept aims for autonomy from the get-go. That is, no pilot in the airplane. Photos of the first flight appear to show a dummy strapped into the seat, standing in for future-paying customers who will have no role in piloting the aircraft. According to John, certifiable autonomy is going to make quiet, clean, and safe urban air mobility possible. And the picture of this device is pretty darn cool. They say electric motors drive the PAV, which uses a mix of lifting rotors and airfoils to achieve vertical takeoff and landings and more efficient forward flight supported by wings. The PAV will have a range of up to 50 miles and is not the only aircraft Boeing is developing for autonomous flight. The next program also includes an unmanned cargo aircraft able to transport up to 500 pounds, among other platforms. And finally, from thestate.com, that's a newspaper in South Carolina, an ex-Navy SEAL with CIA ties 
who was cooperating with federal agents, used his private airplane to deliver thousands of pounds of marijuana around the country. And that led to the detention of Christopher Dougherty, a California man who was identified uh, by the ex-SEAL as the, taking the lead role in the smuggling operation. Now, it turns out that our ex-SEAL, uh, Smith, was arrested back in 2017, and Dougherty at that time called Smith's lawyer and explored how to raise bond money for Smith. Well, the lawyer, Harris, who had no attorney-client relationship with Dougherty, let federal agents listen in on these recorded calls with Dougherty. Then federal agents worked with Smith, who was in custody at the time at the Lexington County Jail, to to record more calls with Dougherty. By that time, Smith was working with federal agents in hopes of getting released on bond and getting a reduced prison sentence in the future. And in fact, federal agents did let him out of prison so that he could pick up marijuana in his airplane from Dougherty in Las Vegas or California and then fly it to various places including Syracuse, New York, Baltimore, Maryland, Madison, Wisconsin, Chicago, Charlotte, Raleigh, and Columbia. Dougherty would then meet Smith at airports in those cities that the ex-SEAL flew into, remove the marijuana from his plane, and distribute it to dealers in those locations. Because of Smith's cooperation, federal agents arrested Dougherty and searched a residence he owned in Napa, California, seizing 800 pounds of marijuana and approximately $400,000. That's the news for this week. Coming up, my weekly updates, and then we'll get on to our main topic about crosswind landings. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And welcome back. Hey, first I want to talk about our opening music, the acronym song, which was sung by Captain Roger Victor of Speed Tape Airlines. <laughs> now you have to know that Captain Roger Victor is a fictional character who is a puppet. Now the puppeteer who produces the videos about Captain Roger Victor and his airline friends is in fact a real professional pilot. But he says that Speed Tape Airlines is fictional and not based on a specific airline, rather on the industry as a whole. Now I love what he wrote here on his Facebook page in the about section. He he says, for all of those who have contacted me about, quote, you shouldn't be encouraging people to pretend to be drunk to get out of an assignment or, quote, you can't steal stuff from a hotel. Here are a few things you need to come to terms with. First, these are puppets. <laughs> they may say things you don't agree with, things that make you mad, things that make you want to report them to the FAA, but chill, they are puppets. So anyway, you can see he has a great sense of humor, and I put a link to uh, the acronym song in our show notes, which I posted earlier on our Patreon site at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And I've also put a link into his uh, Facebook page, which you can find at facebook.com slash Captain Roger. Victor, and we salute him for his great humor, which we can all use from time to time in this industry. And I'd like to give a shout out to the guys over at Simple Flight Radio, Al Waterloo and Mark Eppner. Great episode this week on ADSB. They had uh, Steve Busolari, who they say was one of the original thought leaders and key contributors of building out the ADSB system. He worked for a while at the MIT Labs, and boy, it was fascinating. So if you're any bit of a nerd and you kind of want to understand, hey, what are all the details between TCAS and ADSB and MODES and what is the S by the way in MODES stand for? You're going to find out all that stuff at simpleflight.net slash podcast. So great show this week, guys. Good job. And also want to uh, give a quick shout out to the Airplane Geek Show, which I uh, am a co-host of every week. Uh, this week we had uh, Tom Haynes on from uh, AOPA, talked about a number of things. So hopefully you'll go out and check out that show as well. And by the way, one of my co-hosts on that show, Max Flight, has a new website I want to tell you about. It's called eatattheairport.com. Pretty cool. It says that it's all about visiting your local airport and supporting the eating establishments there. Pins on the map below identify airports with diners, restaurants, or other eating establishments. Also identified are some airports that don't have a place to eat on site, but may have some notable eatery nearby. And they've also got a uh, submit an airport section. So I really want to encourage you to go out to eat at the airport.com. Uh, just below the map, click on submitted airport, put in information about uh, your local airport restaurant. And I did that for a few airport restaurants here in my area. And I think this is a great idea, both for pilots who are looking for, uh, you know, new airports to go fly to where they might have a meal when they get there, but also to help support these businesses at our local airports. I got to tell you, airport restaurants come and go. It's a really, really tough business. So we want to give them all the support we can. And you'll find that at eatattheairport.com. Again, great job, Max. Thanks for doing that. And a shout out to Jennifer, who runs the Tales from the Terminal. 
Airport.com blog, she has her 2019 airport challenge, and she talks about how uh, GA airports, unfortunately, are disappearing. And once we lose an airport, we rarely get it back. She says, how can you help? Well, it's simple. Visit GA airports. And she mentioned that she only visited four GA airports last year, of which uh, just one was one she hadn't been to before. Here's her challenge. She says, in the next 12 months, check out at least five GA airports that you have not previously visited. So I think that's a great idea. In fact, I can think of two that I just drove up to uh, last year because I was in the neighborhood, Sonoma Sky Park and Sonoma Valley, which are both up in the the Napa Valley region. Kind of fun to stop in at both of those airports, talk to people there and see what's going on there. So that is the 2019 Airport Challenge. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. You can check it out at talesfromtheterminal.com. And I also want to thank listener Travis Reese, who sent me a really great video here about two weeks ago. Uh, this is from a flight that he made into Teterboro, New Jersey. Now, Travis is based in Texas, and he flies a Cirrus Vision Jet. And he took the digital data card out of the uh, Vision Jet after the flight, and he took the flight data that had been recorded, and he put it into Cloud Ahoy which then produced essentially a video a recreation of uh, that crosswind landing, complete with a synthetic vision view that shows the view out the aircraft as it's headed toward the uh, toward the airport. Now, I had some passing familiarity with Cloud Ahoy, but I'd never actually seen uh, one of these videos output from the system, and I frankly was really impressed. I think that uh, this might be a training tool that I'll want to look at, especially for uh, teaching crosswind landings. I think it's really great for people to be able to get that kind of visual feedback and replay of uh, the flight from the pilot's view uh, looking out the window. So I'm going to go ahead and post this on our Patreon site. It's a, a YouTube video, and I think you're going to find it uh, pretty fascinating. And we'll talk more about Cloud Ahoy in the future. And here's a note from Jolie Lucas. You may recall that we had her on the show back in episode 72 when we were at Air Venture. She is a psychotherapist as well as an airport advocate, and she's going to be doing a presentation in San Luis Obispo. So you're going to be in Central California. You might be interested in that. It's going to be on February the 21st from 6 to 9 p.m. It's called Exiting the Hold, Reaching Your Life Goals. And she says, much like flying an actual hold, there comes a time in every pilot's career where an honest assessment of performance desires and goals needs to happen. Are you one of the many pilots that are stuck in the hold, unable to complete your aviation goals? So uh, the free admission for that, uh, you also get uh, wings credit, uh, door prize is going to be there. I understand that uh, Lightspeed has donated a headset and that's going to be held at the ACI Jet Center at San Luis Obispo on February the 21st. And let me tell you about a couple of posts on our Patreon site. If you haven't been out there lately, I got a text message almost immediately after the newspaper, the Sierra Sun in Truckee, Tahoe, uh, posted photographs of a Cessna Citation X, which was standing on its tail. Pretty uh, bizarre, but uh, great photos if you want to check it out on the Patreon site. Essentially, this aircraft had uh, arrived at Truckee. It had maintenance that needed to be done, so it could not be flown out before a large storm came. There was not a large enough hangar to put it in, and so the weight of all the accumulated snow on the tail uh, forced this aircraft up at probably almost a 40-degree angle. So it's just sitting on its tail with its nose in the air. I heard later that uh, a day or two later, Textron employees uh, came out and successfully uh, brought it back down, but apparently it still needs uh, some maintenance. Also out on the Patreon site, we've got the acronym song that we listened to a few minutes ago and also that video on the crosswind landing at, at Teterboro. So check that all out. That's at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And I want to thank some new Patreon supporters who have joined us in the last couple of weeks. They include Michael Gwynn, who just edited his pledge from $2 to $4. Thanks very much, Michael. Art Hernandez, who's one of our new super supporters, and I just talked with Art on the phone the other day. He's a, a former federal prosecutor who is thinking about acquiring an aircraft. Also want to thank David and Jimmy Birch. All of that out at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. I want to thank you for all of your contributions and thank everyone who helps support the show in whatever way you do, whether that's posting reviews on various websites, sending us feedback, sending us email. Really appreciate all the feedback. That's what puts gas in my tank and keeps me going each week. So just keep it up. Thanks so much for your support. Coming up next, we're going to talk about crosswind landings right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast.
Okay, let's talk about crosswind landings. I've been thinking about this because we had some winter storms pass through here two weeks ago, and I was able to get some excellent crosswind landing practice for two of my students who are approaching solo. In fact, after watching one of them perform the landings, I decided that, yeah, he was ready for solo, though, of course, not at that airport with those strong crosswinds on that day. I did shoot some video of some of those landings and posted one of the student pilot videos on our Patreon site out at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome if you want to see that. Now, first, I'd like to mention that I talked at length about secrets for making good short field landings back in episode 85, and virtually everything I talked about in that episode applies to crosswind landings. So if you haven't heard that episode, you may want to go back and listen to it at aviationnewstalk.com slash 85. That'll take you directly to the episode. So you can really think of crosswind landings as being a traditional landing where you have to add some additional techniques for handling the crosswind. And I would recommend that you practice crosswind landings frequently, especially if you're based out of an airport with just a single runway. Now, obviously, if there are multiple runways at your airport, you're less likely to have to land with a severe crosswind. However, airports with multiple runways, they create the perfect opportunity for practicing crosswind landings. For example, when I'm trying to find a crosswind, I'll often go to an airport like Tracy, California or Salinas, California, because both of these have crossing runways. And then instead of using the runway that faces into the wind, I'll use the other one to create a crosswind for practice. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, I was out at Tracy and there was a very strong wind that was almost straight down runway 30. So we were using runway 26. And another pilot who was approaching the airport called in and asked us how that runway was working out for us, presumably because he thought that perhaps that was the runway that favored the wind. And I told him, hey, it's working out just great for us. And then after a pause, I added that it was great because I was looking for lots of crosswind for my student to practice with. And he got the hint and landed on the other runway. Now, there have been times in the past when I've been in the traffic pattern with one other aircraft also doing pattern work, except that we were using different runways. And as long as both aircraft are accurately reporting their position and keeping track of each other, this can actually work much better than you might think. Now, there are two main methods of accomplishing a crosswind approach and landing, the crab method and the wing low or side slip method. And as you might imagine, neither method is necessarily better than the other. They are different and there are trade-offs between them. For example, the crab method is probably easier for most pilots to maintain during the approach on final, but then as you enter the flare to land, it requires a high degree of judgment and timing in removing the crab just prior to touchdown. So by contrast, the wing low method may be a little bit more difficult to set up properly when you're on final, but once you've got it established properly, it's much easier to use as you enter the flare and start to land because you're already pretty much set up and configured for flying the flare and the touchdown. Now, generally pilots will pick one crosswind method that they prefer, but there's no right or wrong method. And most manufacturers don't even tell you which method to use for their aircraft, though there is one manufacturer that does state which method to use for crosswind landings. And I'll tell you more about that in a few moments. First, let's talk about the crab method. Now, one of the big advantages of the crab is that it can handle stronger crosswinds than the wing low method. And that's because there's no limit to how far you can point the nose left or right when you're in a crab. However, if you're using the low wing method, you're eventually going to run out of rudder. And when your foot is pushed to the floor, there's no more rudder available. And that's going to limit the maximum amount of crosswind that you can handle with the wing low method. Now back to the crab, to begin compensating for a crosswind of the crab, you simply point the aircraft into the wind at an angle that keeps you on the extended center line of the runway. And once you're established in the crab, your wings stay level. Now it may seem a little odd, but when you are established in a crab, you are not looking straight ahead. Instead, you are looking out the side of the windshield toward the runway. It's important that you look at the runway because that's the only way that you're going to be able to tell if you were still on the extended center line of the runway or if you're drifting to the left or right of the center line. Now, to determine if you're on the center line, and this applies for any landing, you want to look at the runway to see if it's shaped like a perfect trapezoid where just two sides are parallel to each other. And one of those parallel sides is shorter than the other side. So to turn a runway into a trapezoid, think of the approach end of the runway as being wider than the departure end of the runway, which is the way it's going to look, frankly, when you look at it, when you're out there on final. And that's because you're closer to the threshold, so it appears wider than the far end of the runway. But the key is to look at the long sides of the runway. 
from your perspective out there on final, they're going to look like slanted lines that lead from the wider threshold at the front end of the runway to the shorter far end of the runway. And when you're on the center line, the two long sides of the runway are going to be symmetrical. So if you're off a little to the left or a little to the right of the center line, the sides of the runway are going to be asymmetrical. They're not going to be equal in size and shape. So the key in crosswind correction is to figure out the right amount of correction that will keep you in a position where the runway remains looking symmetrical as you fly toward it. Now, no matter how good you are, you will always be making small corrections to stay on the center line. And I think the difference between experienced pilots and less experienced pilots, and this, by the way, is true for just about everything, is that experienced pilots notice the deviations from the center line sooner, and so they only need to make small corrections to stay on the center line. By contrast, less experienced pilots, well, they don't notice the deviations as quickly, so they end up having to make larger corrections when they finally notice them to get back on the center line. So to make small corrections with a crab method, you will make very, very tiny brief turns so that you're moving the nose a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right to change the angle relative to the runway. Well, obviously during these very brief turns, the aircraft wings are not level, but this is only for maybe a second or two, and then you're going to continue to fly with the wings level, but with the nose still pointed to one side of the runway into the wind. Now, you might be wondering, instead of making small turns with coordinated ailerons and rudder, why not just use the rudder alone to yaw the aircraft slightly left or right for the small turns that are required? And the answer is yes, you could do that, but I don't think it's a great idea. Now, that is a technique that's sometimes used by instrument pilots when they're flying an ILS approach after they're inside the final approach fix and are getting close to the runway because that lets them make very, very tiny left and right corrections. But the difference is, when you're flying an instrument approach, you're going to be at a much higher speed than the final approach speed for a landing. Therefore, a pilot is far less likely to get too slow and stall the aircraft on an instrument approach. And using just the rudder, well, to try and steer the airplane left and right, that's going to be inherently an uncoordinated technique. And if you were to stall an aircraft while it's uncoordinated, good chance you're going to enter a spin. Therefore, I recommend that you use coordinated ailerons and rudder when you make those small turns when you're using the crab method for crosswind compensation. Now, I should note that almost always as you get closer to the ground, the wind strength decreases and the angle from which the wind is coming will probably change a little bit. So usually you can expect that you're going to need a smaller and smaller crab angle as you get closer to the runway and closer to the ground. Uh, You may have heard a recommendation from flight instructors in the past that maybe you should land with less flaps when you have a strong crosswind. Uh, For example, in the past, some CFIs have told me to land a Cessna 172 in strong crosswinds with just 20 degrees of flaps instead of full flaps. Now, one of the lines of reasonings I think I heard then was that the aircraft would somehow be more stable in a strong crosswind once it's on the ground if you don't have it set for full flaps. The FAA's Airplane Flying Handbook does say the degree to which flaps are extended vary with the airplane's handling characteristics as well as the wind velocity. But I should note that I have never noticed any difference in the handling of aircraft on the ground when full flaps are used in any wind situation. So that being said, there may indeed be aircraft out there that I haven't flown or wind conditions that I haven't experienced. So use your own best judgment about what flap settings to use when landing in a strong crosswind. And by the way, I may be biased as my home airport is relatively short and I don't like floating the long distances down the runway that occur when you use less than full flaps. And by the way, in the uh, Cirrus, Uh, It specifically says that you should use full flaps when landing with a crosswind. Now, if you find you're unable to stay on the center line when using the crab method, you may want to get some additional flight instruction because theoretically, you should be able to track the center line using the crab method in just about any crosswind up until it exceeds the speed of your aircraft. Now, of course, at that point, you would be pointed 90 degrees to the left or to the right of the runway. And while you might be able to track the center line, actually getting the airplane on the runway at those kinds of speeds might be an entirely different story. Of course, the crosswind may be too strong for either the capabilities of the airplane or the capabilities of the pilot. In that case, you should definitely go around and consider using a different runway at that airport if there is one, or perhaps just going to a different airport and waiting for the winds to get better. The only really tricky part about landing with the crab method is the actual landing of the aircraft. That's because you'll need to hold the crab angle until you are relatively close to the surface of the runway, literally just entering the flare. 
And then you will need to push hard on one of the rudders to straighten the aircraft so that it is parallel to the runway and simultaneously lower one of the wings into the wind just enough so that the aircraft stays on the center line. Now, from this point forward until you touch down, everything that you're going to be doing to land using the crab method is going to be really identical to what you'd be doing if you'd been using the wing lower side slip method to compensate for the crosswind on your approach to landing. So let's switch gears now and talk about the wing low method, and then we'll come back to the actual touchdown later. One of the nice things about the wing low method is that as you fly down the final, the aircraft will be pointed at the runway, and so you'll be able to look straight ahead through the windshield at the runway. And to compensate for the crosswind, you'll lower the upwind wing into the wind. So, for example, if the wind is coming from the right, you will lower the right wing into the wind, just enough to keep the aircraft on the extended center line of the runway. But since your right wing is down, the aircraft will start to turn to the right. Therefore, you'll need to hold opposite rudder, in this case the left rudder, to prevent the aircraft from turning to the right. And you'll get instant feedback as to whether you have the wing lowered the proper amount. For example, if the wind is coming from the right and you have the right wing too low, the aircraft will drift further and further to the right side of the center line. Likewise, if the right wing is not lowered enough, the wind from the right will blow the aircraft to the left of the center line. So you'll be increasing and decreasing the bank angle until you find just the right bank that will keep the aircraft stable on the center line. Likewise, you'll get instant feedback if you have too much or too little rudder. Again, using this example, the wind coming from the right and the right wing lowered into the wind, you're going to use whatever left rudder it takes, that is the opposite rudder, to keep the fuselage of the aircraft parallel to the runway. And you'll do that even if the aircraft has drifted to the right or to the left of the center line. Just remember, you want to always keep the fuselage of the aircraft parallel to the runway, even when you're not on the center line. And that's true as you're descending on the final. It's also true when you're in the flare about to touch down on the runway. Now, as I said earlier, typically the wind strength decreases as you get close to the surface. So for example, if the wind is coming from the right and you have the right wing lowered into the wind, you can expect that you'll be gradually decreasing the amount of bank of the right wing as you get closer to the ground. Likewise, as you decrease the amount of bank of the right wing, you'll also reduce the amount of opposite rudder used. Now, let's imagine for a moment the wind is still coming from the right, but you are to the left of the center line. You're going to need to lower the right wing enough so that the aircraft starts moving to the right and approaches the center line. Then, as you come up on the center line, you're going to need to reduce the bank angle just enough so that the aircraft stops moving to the right and stays on the center line. Now, if you reduce the bank too much, the wind will start pushing the aircraft back to the left again. So you'll increase and decrease the bank angle of one of the wings to move the aircraft left and right until you get the aircraft on the center line. And then you'll adjust the bank angle so that it's just steep enough to compensate for the crosswind, eliminating all the left and right movement while leaving the aircraft on the center line. As you reach the runway, you'll perform the same roundout maneuver in the flare that you would for any normal landing. The difference is that you will keep the upwind wing lowered into the wind. Now, a common mistake that I see pilots make is that they level the wings as they enter the flare. And I think they do that because they're worried that perhaps the wingtip is going to hit the ground. However, the moment they make the wings go level in the flare, the wind starts blowing the aircraft toward the edge of the runway. So it's really essential that you leave the upwind wing down throughout the flare so that the aircraft is not moving left or right when it touches down. If it does touch down while moving left or right, this imposes high side loads on the tire for which it's not designed. Now, when done properly, the main landing gear will not touch down at the same time. That's what's going to happen if the wings are level. Going back to our example with the wind coming from the right, when you touch down, the right wheel should touch down first, then the left wheel should touch down, and finally you'll be able to gently lower the nose and let the nose wheel touch down on the surface. Now, let's go back for a moment to the flare where you're flying parallel to the runway and you're only a couple feet above the runway. As the aircraft slows in the flare, there is less air moving over the ailerons, and so they will gradually become less effective. Therefore, as the aircraft slows, you're going to have to make bigger movements of the yoke to get the same effect out of the ailerons. So, going back to our example with the wind coming from the right, as the aircraft slows, you may find that you have to turn the yoke progressively more and more to the right as the aircraft slows in the flare, just to maintain the same amount of wind correction. 
Now, after you touch down and the aircraft is decelerating on the runway, more and more aileron is going to be applied to keep that upwind wing from rising. As the airplane comes to a stop, the aileron controls are going to be held fully into the wind. Also, in many aircraft, such as Cessnas and Pipers, the nose wheel and the rudder are interconnected. So think about this. If you're holding some left rudder to compensate for that wind, well, at touchdown, you're going to need to immediately neutralize those rudder pedals. Otherwise, if you continue to hold the rudder, you're going to be steering the nose wheel toward the edge of the runway. So as soon as you touch down, neutralize the rudder pedals. Now, pilots who are flying aircraft like Diamonds and Columbias and Cirrus, they don't have to worry about that because these aircraft have free cast ring nose wheel, which means you have no way to control them with the rudder pedals. And so the nose wheel is just going to track straight down the runway in whatever direction the aircraft is pointed once you touch down. Now, one of the challenges of learning to handle a crosswind is that we just often can't find a crosswind when we want one. There are a few crosswind simulators around the country. These are not common items, but if you can find one, they are really excellent for learning and practicing crosswind landing skills. Now, there is one in San Carlos Airport, which is near me at the San Carlos Flight Center. And I have routinely sent all my student pilots uh, up for a session in that simulator as part of their training for the pilot certificate. The model they have there, according to their website, is the X-Wind 200 simulator, and I'll include a link to that in the show notes. Now, let me tell you what I do for crosswind landings. I have always preferred the low wing method, also known as the side slip method, since once I get it established on final, there are very few changes I need to make before touching down on the runway. And this is the primary method that I've used for years while teaching and flying various aircraft. Now, a couple of years ago, I was teaching at a Cirrus Owner Pilots Association event in Las Vegas, and it was on a day when the winds were exactly at the SR-22's max demonstrated crosswind of 20 knots. Now, the pilot I was assigned to fly with wanted to practice crosswinds, and it turns out he and I were the only pilots at the event who went out and fly that morning. Everybody else just thought, eh, a little too much wind. So I gave the first uh, demo landing using the wing low method. Now, what really shocked me was just how disorienting the view through the windshield appeared when using the low wing method in an SR-22 with a 20-knot direct crosswind. I'll tell you, it was so disorienting and uncomfortable that I pretty quickly decided to switch and use the crab method, which I almost never used. And what really surprised me was that the incident I went from that very disorienting view, I suddenly had a very comfortable and easy-to-manage technique. Uh, It was just day and night. So for whatever reason, in the Cirrus aircraft, I find that uh, the crab method uh, really is uh, much, 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 much easier to use when you have high crosswinds. So after I did my demonstration landing, my client made one landing and he decided that he'd had enough for the day. And so we went back in. Now, later I dug deeper into the Cirrus flight operations manual, and that's where I discovered that Cirrus recommends the crab method for crosswind landings in their aircraft. (laughs) And now I know why. So I don't recall any other manufacturer specifying which crosswind uh, technique to use when landing their aircraft. So I was a little surprised to discover that. And so now I use the crab method whenever I fly, since these days I'm only teaching in Cirrus aircraft. Well, there you have it, crosswind landings from A to Z. If you haven't practiced any recently, go find a flight instructor and drag them along and go practice some crosswinds. You'll probably be glad you did. Coming up next, lots of listener feedback. We'll be right back. Welcome back. And good news in the midst of recording this podcast, there's been an announcement that apparently a deal has been struck to reopen the U.S. government for three weeks. So hopefully it will stay open permanently after that. So keep our fingers crossed. But if it doesn't, at least we know the kinds of problems that we're going to face in aviation if we see that to happen again. Now let's get to some listener feedback. Here's an email from Fred in New York, and he's talking about episode number 86. Now that's the show where I was passing along my tips for kind of minimizing the effects of turbulence when you're using an autopilot. And I said that over the years, what I've discovered is that the airplane will be smoother if you engage the autopilot in vertical 
speed zero as opposed to the alt mode and in uh, roll mode, which just basically keeps the wings level versus in heading mode. And the reason is that when you're in turbulence and the aircraft, you know, gets banged off of altitude or, or, you know, knocked off of your heading, the autopilot will work to get the aircraft in a level attitude, but it won't work hard to, uh, you know, maintain the exact altitude or maintain the exact heading. Now, over time, you will have to fix the heading a little bit because it will drift uh, off of that heading. But what Fred says is, I would suggest that centering the heading bug and then pressing heading in the autopilot might be better than roll mode because heading mode will give you wings level, while roll mode might keep you in your current mode if you're not banked within about five degrees of uh, zero. He said the good news is that roll mode will be limited to about 22 degrees, so maybe not so bad. It goes on a little bit. And Fred, Yes, heading mode is going to work uh, in that situation, but not quite as well as roll mode. Now, roll mode is different in different autopilots. Sounds like you have been using the uh, Garmin GFC 700, perhaps in a uh, Cessna G1000. Uh, and that's exactly how that roll mode works. If you're less than six degrees of bank when you engage it, it's going to revert to zero degrees. If you are more than 22 degrees of bank, it's going to revert to 22 or to whatever bank angle you were in uh, when you punch the button. Uh, a lot of autopilots, roll, means, roll mode just means keep the wings level. And yeah, uh, it's going to be less work for you to keep it on the heading, but it is going to be a little bit more turbulence because the autopilot is going to fight to maintain that heading as opposed to just fighting to keep the wings level. So yeah, you can certainly do it that way. It's not going to be quite as smooth as if you use uh, roll mode. Here's an email from RH. He's one of the uh, hosts of Opposing Bases, which is a podcast by two aircraft controllers that we've talked about a couple of times on this show. He writes, pardon me if I have the episode wrong, but I believe you just had a discussion about how to name the different legs in the pattern, specifically uh, upwind versus departure leg. Uh, so yes, there was a someone who wrote in to say that the correct name when you first depart the airport is that you're on the departure leg. I mentioned that I've used the term uh, upwind leg. He says our pilot controller glossary in the JO 7110.65 says upwind, so it doesn't say departure. Uh, he says, however, the pilot handbook of aeronautical knowledge uses the term departure leg. He also says that within the handbook of aeronautical knowledge, the term upwind gets used in reference to uh, the relative airport position on page 14-2. So I think his point there is that the uh, pilot handbook of aeronautical knowledge uses both terms. He says, as a controller, we were taught that the term upwind leg is to be used to describe the leg referred to as the departure leg in the pilot handbook of aeronautical knowledge. Furthermore, I have never heard it referred to as a departure leg, either flying as a pilot or as a controller. The listener seemed upset about the inconsistency, and I understand his hesitation to use upwind, but in ATC, it's the approved terminology and likely won't change, despite efforts to unify the two conflicting sets of phraseology. Thanks for the great show, RH at Opposing Bases Air Traffic uh, Talk Podcast. Well, RH, thanks so much for your uh, email there, and I guess that helps to uh, clarify why so many of us use the term upwind and why all controllers uh, use it. So we've got two different inconsistent uh, references for whether that leg should be called the upwind leg or the departure leg. Here's an email from uh, Patreon, George uh, Strohmeyer. He says, hi, Max. Continue to really appreciate your show. Even if I bought a Bonanza instead of a Cirrus, <laughs> we'll text you the moment I am wishing I had a shoot. He said he recently left some of the business cards for the Aviation News Talk podcast on bulletin boards at 29 Palms and Cable Airports in Southern California. He says, I'm an old-fashioned guy. None of the social media for me. I've added two enthusiastic subscribers to your show through recommendations to friends. Plan to attend your Bay Tour seminar in mid-February in Palo Alto. Uh, for once, I won't be traveling. Keep going, George. So, George, thanks so much for all of your support for the show. Greatly appreciate it. Here's a message that came from Robert via LinkedIn. He says, Max, thanks for another thoughtful, helpful episode on ANT. Hmm, ANT. I guess that stands for Aviation News Talk. He said, this will be tabbed a resource in my files. I am an all-in four-flight IFR private pilot guy. So he's referring to uh, episode 94, where we talked with Gary Reeves about four-flight. He says, however, in the early days, I resisted iOS and tried to be all Android. Luckily, early on, I discovered Avare, A-V-A-R-E app, a fully functional electronic flight bag, and it's basically free. Check it out. It says it might be a good story. So there you have it. If you are using an Android and you're looking for a uh, moving map uh, type app for pilots, check out Avare, A-V-A-R-E. Let's go now to listener questions. Hi, Max. This is Chris. I enjoyed your episode on carbon monoxide poisoning. But one thing I don't think I heard you mention was the effect of engine leaning. 
As I understand it from reading John Deacon's Mike Bush and others, running lean of peak greatly reduces the amount of carbon monoxide the engine produces, and therefore there is less carbon monoxide available to enter the cockpit and subsequently the pilot's bloodstream. My question is, even if one does not subscribe to uh, the, lean of me- the lean of peak method of operation, if carbon monoxide poisoning is suspected, would it not be prudent to add to your emergency checklist, along with closing heater vents and opening fresh air vents, to aggressively lean the mixture to the limits of engine performance so as to mitigate the problem? Thanks again for putting together such a great podcast. Chris, thanks so much for your question. Yes, I think that's a really excellent idea. So I totally agree with you. If you suspect carbon monoxide, definitely uh, change the leaning on your engine to uh, lean of peak. Now, I have been a long time believer in lean of peak since I started reading John Deacon's articles back in probably about 1999. I bought a Cessna 210 in uh, 2000, and we promptly uh, set it up with the GAMI injectors, which are specially tuned fuel injectors, which allow lean of peak uh, operation to uh, to occur. And for sure, you burn less fuel, and you're definitely going to uh, create uh, less exhaust fumes as well, too. Here's an email from Stacy in Arizona. Stacy says, in episode 84, the controller stated that we cannot turn base unless told by the tower. I have always been taught and taught my students and have been told by the tower that we are able to turn base and final. We just cannot touch down without a clearance. Either way, we could be increasing our danger. If I don't turn in a normal pattern, I could be interfering with someone who's coming in on a deep base. But if I do turn without a clearance, I could be interfering with someone on final. Did the guest speaker give you any references to where he said this was wrong? And Stacy, I think you raise a really excellent point. I don't think there is any reference in any of the literature that says a pilot at a towered airport is not allowed to turn base without a clearance. I think it's great practice, by the way, and it's one that I picked up from my towered airport over the years and from other towered airports where I learned that often at uh, some of the local airports around here, controllers get a little bit upset if you turn base without letting them know. Uh, which is why if I haven't been uh, given any kind of clearance when I'm on downwind, as I'm turning base, I'll go ahead and say, hey, we're about to start turning base. And if they've forgotten us, that kind of <laughs> gives them a heads up. They need to give us a clearance. Or if for some reason they don't want us to turn base, it's a perfect opportunity for them to go, oh, wait, no, keep <laughs> continue on your uh, downwind. So all I can say is uh, local procedures vary a little bit from uh, airport to airport. And I don't think there is anything in any of the regulations that say you're not allowed to turn base uh, without a uh, landing clearance. In fact, I'm just about positive about that. Here's an email from uh, Bob in uh, California. He says, earlier this afternoon, I was returning on a VFR flight from Lincoln to my home airport in Livermore in my decathlon. Shortly after contacting the tower, I was assigned to enter a right base for a landing on runway 25 right. As I flew the right base, I was given traffic as a Cherokee, also bound for Livermore at my six o'clock. The Cherokee was gaining on me, and the tower sensed a conflict. Rather than give either of us delaying vectors, the tower instructed me to, quote, fly direct to the numbers clear to land. I've been given this instruction previously at Livermore, and given the light winds, I felt comfortable on how to really fly it. Rather than flying their instructions precisely, I flew direct to the start of the approach lights for my short final approach. I pity the poor low-time and experienced pilot who will try to follow these instructions literally, especially in strong winds. Have you ever been given fly direct to the numbers. Seems to me this is like tower instructions telling you to turn, make S turns on final. He says, I don't believe that fly direct to the numbers is actually in the controller's handbook. What do you think? Hmm. You know, I'll have to research that for you. I'm guessing it's not in the controller's handbook, uh, but I also have heard that instruction on many occasions. And I think you were right. And they probably don't mean literally, you know, come at an angle to the numbers and then turn to line up with the runway because that's a little too late, you know, unless you've got a really long runway. So I think what you did was perfectly fine by aiming at the front of the approach lights. You were probably arriving maybe a tenth or at the most two tenths of a mile from the uh, from the end of the runway near the numbers. So, Bob, it sounds to me like you handled that pretty well. Hey, as the listeners to the show know, I help people with Cirrus aircraft. So if you think someday you might be buying a new or slightly used Cirrus, call me up today. It's a free call. Happy to talk to you about all the ins and outs, and I might even be able to arrange a free demo flight for you, depending upon, uh, you know, whether you're looking at a new or used aircraft. As you all know by now, I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people like you around the world. 
Now, if you haven't been on to our Patreon site, go on out there today, aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. Go ahead and check out all the extra content that I post there for people who want to uh, see things in addition to what they hear on the show. And if you get some value from this show and you feel like you're in a position to contribute, you can go ahead and do that right there with your credit card and uh, send us some of your support every month. And finally, if you would take just a moment and tell one or two of your aviation friends about the Aviation News Talk podcast. And if they don't know what a podcast is, well, go ahead and show them. Until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.